Healthcare is making a continuous effort to search for a better patient outcome with decreased costs. It is pertinent that higher educational institutions such as baccalaureate universities ensure that future nurses graduate with the knowledge, leadership, and collaborative skills in order to achieve this goal. This is a documentary on the Institute of Medicine's Future of Nursing Report, and the future of nursing starts with you. In 2010, the IOM released a report to serve as a mission to improve patient outcomes through the nursing practice. Eight recommendations were stated within the report that can be summarized in four key messages. Nurses should practice to their full extent of their education and training. Nurses should achieve higher levels of education and training through improved educational systems that promote seamless academic progression. Nurses should be full partners with physicians and other healthcare professionals to redesign the healthcare of America and effective workforce planning and policy making between the collaboration of the Workforce Commission, the Health Resources and Services Administration, the State Licensing Boards, State Nursing Workforce Centers, and the Department of Labor to ensure that data of healthcare personnel shortages are timely and publicly accessible in order to make plans for appropriate increasing of the supply of healthcare professionals. For many years, the Institute of Medicine has been engaged in an effort to improve the nation's health care, pointing to shortcomings in quality and safety in such reports as To Air is Human and Crossing the Quality Chasm now a decade ago, pointing to the importance of transforming the education of health professionals in reports such as Bridge to Quality, redesigning continuing education in the health professions and others talking about the needs in a variety of health professions, and specifically dealing with changing needs in our population, such as the recent report on retooling for an aging America. In all of these efforts, one common factor always stands out. Nurses are critical to the health and health care of America. They represent the largest segment of the nation's health care workforce. Nurses work in every imaginable sector of healthcare, from the battlefield to nursing homes. And nurses are central to the core goals of high quality, effective care. When this report came out in 2010, what was the general sentiment here at the College of Nursing? Um, the fact that our report came out stressing the importance of nurses and where to go with, with education and advancing the nurses' position in terms of the importance in the medical profession. I think we were probably excited about it. Always a little bit nervous when people want us to change things, but um, I've been in nursing for over 30 years, and I've been in nursing education for about 20 of that. And so there have always been conversations about how do, we, um, how do we move forward, how do we change the conversation around what should the uh, entry-level degree be has, is an age-old uh, discussion um, of whether it should be an associate degree or a baccalaureate degree. So that has been around for as long as I can remember having those discussions, and we're still having those discussions, but I think there's some things that are happening now to, um, to really take action in some of those areas. So I think we were um, happy to see that to the point that all of our faculty read this book and we had discussions on it. The dean bought copies of this for everybody, and this is the Carnegie report um, that was based off the IOM report, and it was Educated Nurses, A Call for Radical Transformation. Patricia Benner was one of the authors, as well as Molly Sutphin, Victoria Leonard, and Lisa Day. The IOM recommends that the percentage of nurses with a baccalaureate degree increase from 50% to 80% by 2020. Why do you think that 
this increase from 50 to 80 percent is so important in that time frame. In the past, we've always said, we just think BSNs are better prepared. We didn't have the evidence to back that up and the studies to back that up. There are a lot of studies out there now. Um, and those studies have found that nurses are prepared at a BSN level, that they have stronger communication and problem-solving skills, they're stronger leaders, uh, they're leaders in research and evaluation skills, and that facilities that have a higher percentage of BSN prepared nurses, they have better patient outcomes and lower mortality rates in their hospitals. Um, and so there are some studies here. The first studies that came out that really brought this to light was um, Dr. Linda Aiken, and it was actually published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, in 2003. And they uh, went to a hospital and they looked at that, and there was a clear link between higher levels of nursing education and better patient outcomes. Um, they were able to show a difference in mortality rates if people, that there were BSN nurses taking care of patients as opposed to associate degree nurses. And that doesn't mean that associate degree programs are going to be obsolete, but what it does mean for us is that we need to look at ways to create seamless pathways for nurses to get their BSN. Uh, it's not always feasible just because of the demand of nurses. All you've heard all week, if you've watched any news or seen the Daily Reflector, mm -hmm. is about the nursing shortage. Uh, that has been a hot topic locally this week. And so um, that is one of the things that, um, you know, we couldn't shut down all the, the, back, the associate degree programs because the demand is too great for nurses. But what we can do is we can focus on ways to have these seamless pathways for students to be able to go from their associate degree to get their BSN and on to DMPs, PhDs. And so um, in North Carolina and here at ECU, we are doing a lot of things for that. Uh, the state of North Carolina had approved earlier this year a uniform articulation agreement, nursing articulation agreement, which means that we have an articulation agreement in place now. It's been approved by the general uh, administration of the UNC system and the uh, North Carolina Community College system. It has been years in the making and finally got approved. I, I think the end of last year, actually, it got approved. So we now have that in place. It's been mandated. We put it on our website. And it, as of today, the corrected version is out there. Um, on our website, if you go to our undergraduate and click on RMBSN, there's a link for a uniform articulation agreement. Um, so what that means is that students who start in a community college in North Carolina that adhere to the articulation agreement. That means they have to have those, all the courses that are listed in the articulation agreement, and they're like blocks of courses that are prereqs and their nursing courses and then our RMBSN courses. They can complete, they entered in one of those programs in fall of 2015. When they graduate, they should have all the courses they need for us and not need any additional prerequisites. And they can come, apply to come straight into our RMBSN program. Here at Bionet, we believe that healthcare organizations should support and help nurses. Um, we want the nurses to take the lead in developing and adapting patient-centered care models. Um, our new graduates have projects to do before they even get off orientation that are centered around patient care and what's best for the patient, how to involve the family members, how to educate our family members. Um, for kind of a long time, it's been patient versus doctor. You know, the patients came to the doctors when they needed help, but there wasn't a whole lot of family engagement. There wasn't a whole lot of community engagement, so in involving the families with the new graduate projects, um, with some of the forms that tell it teaches how to involve the families more, we can focus more on the education. We can focus more on involving that family, involving the community, and getting the generic education out there and helping maybe increase some of our compliance levels, give people the tools that they need to manage their health at home, decrease our readmission rates, let them be healthy, let them live fulfilled lives without having to come in here and have us try to fix things that could have been prevented to begin with. Um, at Biden we are magnet status. That means that our RN ratios are a little bit lower. Our RNs are more engaged with the patients, with the care, with the physicians. We have nurse forums. We have nurse-led excuse me, committees. Um, they help develop po policies. We do a lot of our policies and a lot of our recommendations based on evidence-based practice, which means We've got the evidence to back up what we're doing. We're not just saying, do this because it's a good idea. We've got the solid evidence to back it up. Um, we want to affect change. We want to affect change in our, our profession. We want our nurses to feel like they're empowered. We want them to know that they're making a difference. 
Um, a lot of times the mentality tends to be now, oh, well, we've got to make them happy, we've got to keep them satisfied. The number one way to keep our patients and families satisfied is to give them the tools they need to maintain their health once they leave us. I had an opportunity to, um, I was going to move back to rural eastern North Carolina, that's where I'm from, and and looking at jobs there, ended up back in a home health agency. And at the time, those were run out of health departments. They weren't private like they are now, so it was eons ago. And um, as I was doing that, and I really loved that too, I had an opportunity, I will tell you this, um, that I was the newest and the youngest nurse on that staff, and the supervisor uh, ended up having to move because her husband was with the bank and he was being transferred. Um, and he, I had been out of school just over a year and I was asked to take over the supervisor position and the reason that I got that over other people who had been there longer than I had is because I had a baccalaureate degree and nobody else did and so early on that kind of set me apart um, at that time in terms of advancement <laughs> Here on EC's main campus today, interviewing different age groups on what they um, or what their opinion is on nurse practitioners being primary care providers and whether or not they trust their opinion when going to a primary care provider. We're also educating them on whether or not they know the knowledge of the scope of practice of a nurse practitioner and why they are capable of doing this job and not being under a doctor in a doctor's office. Do you know anyone that goes to a nurse practitioner or do you go to a nurse practitioner as your primary care provider? Uh, yes, I know people. You do, but you don't you go to a doctor? Right. Okay. Um, no, not as front. Look, I've seen nurse practitioners, but not as my primary, as primary care provider and stuff. You do? You know plenty. And do you see, do you see a nurse practitioner or do you see a doctor? Oh, I see you see what? I see an intro Okay. Or you don't know anyone? Do you know the difference in a nurse and a nurse practitioner? I don't know. I was practicing for one. I'd fail a quiz on it. I don't know exactly the difference. I know there's more schooling for a nurse right. practitioner versus an RN, so I don't know. Right. Um, another question that we have for you is after hearing what they do and what they are capable of doing um, and what they learn in school, would you trust a nurse practitioner as your primary care provider? Yes. Why, or why would you say that you would? Just because you know that they have the education and the experience? Yes, I mean, they seem pretty much sort of like a doctor, just without the doctor's um, Basically, our question are just to get to the point of um, that nurse practitioners are capable of doing a job that they are already doing, but without uh, being in a doctor's office so that they can open up their own doctor's or their own nurse practitioner office. Okay. Well, that is an awesome response. Thank you. Are you optimistic about the future of nursing in terms of what the Institute of Medicine recommends? And if, if, those, if we do march in that same direction, that things will improve, not just for the career advancement for nurses, but for patient outcomes and healthcare in general? I think so. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with people like you who are in nursing school, who have that desire and want to do that. Because, I mean, Let's face it, you're, you're the people who are going to be carrying that torch on. Um, and I do think it's at a great time. There's so much about health care in our um, society and, in our, and politically. And nurses need to be policy makers, and they need to be at the table for making those policies and for saying this is going to work or this won't work, and why. You know, because you need to always back it up with this is why we don't think this will work, and here's the evidence for that. Um, and so I think as long as we can move in that direction, and we're willing to be assertive and willing to stick our neck out there and say, you know, hey, we're representing nursing and as nursing will come together and speak as a whole, I think that we're headed on the right trajectory right now.
If Nightingale were alive today, she would find a way to help move this important work forward and would encourage nurses to become informed and involved. The future of nursing and of successful health care reform depends on every nurse finding a way to be a part of this important work. Thank you.